Hi folks, Astronomy Live here. 2025 marks 25 years that I've been doing astrophotography through a telescope, and I've decided to bring it full circle and pick up the medium that I first started on, film. For the last few months, I've been taking photos with a mechanical film SLR camera attached to the telescope. 25 years ago, I was using this Newtonian telescope on an equatorial mount. It had a mechanical clock drive, but that wasn't good enough to do any kind of deep space work. The best I could hope for were some photos of the moon, and they were nothing to write home about, but I was nevertheless hooked on the hobby. I had always wanted to do deep space astrophotography, but it simply wasn't in my capability back then. But now that I have a much more capable telescope and the ability to do some proper guiding, I wanted to see if I could take film astrophotography and actually do some deep space imaging with it. With digital astrophotography, we can average or stack hundreds or even thousands of frames together to make the final product. But on film, you don't have that luxury. To make matters worse, on film we have a problem called reciprocity failure. The longer you expose film, the less sensitive it is to light. Even before reciprocity failure starts taking effect, normal speeds of film are inherently less sensitive to light than modern digital image sensors anyway. Old film SLR cameras can also suffer from a variety of problems due to their age. This is a light leak on the film due to deteriorating seals around the edge of the film compartment. The first roll of film I shot has a variety of light leaks like this leaving red streaks across the film. This is due to light entering from the back of the camera and passing through the back of the film, causing it to be filtered into a red color before it exposes the crystals of the film. I switched to a different SLR camera body after I discovered this to avoid that problem going forward. But let's talk about what it takes to do long exposure film astrophotography through a telescope. You'll need a shutter release cable which will thread onto the shutter button on the top of the camera and allow you to lock open the shutter for long exposures with the bulb setting. In fact, you can leave the shutter open as long as you need to for very long exposure astrophotography. In fact, with a standard camera lens and a basic tripod, you could do star trail astrophotography without needing any kind of tracking mount or telescope. But if you are going to use a telescope, you'll need to guide the telescope to make sure to correct for any tracking errors over the very long exposure. I used this observer's chair to achieve a variable height and be able to get to just the right height to see through the eyepiece of the main telescope while the film camera was exposing on a piggybacked refractor. Of course, you could also use a separate autoguider camera. But to test my skills, I wanted to do things the old-fashioned way with an illuminated reticle eyepiece. This eyepiece uses an LED to illuminate a reticle in the middle, but a proper guider eyepiece would actually have an open square in the middle of the crosshair to allow you to see the star while it's dead in the center of the eyepiece. I made do with the eyepiece that I had on hand by tucking the guide star into the corner of the crosshair and keeping it there with the hand controller of the telescope. Now this requires a great deal of diligence and patience because the film exposures I'm about to show you are up to an hour long. And if I were under darker skies, I could go even longer still. Now, a film SLR's viewfinder is not designed to be used with a telescope. It has a matte finish that darkens the target and makes it much harder to see. So for the first roll, I focused on the moon, but I found that the focus came out quite blurry. Once again, on this first roll, you can also see the effect of light leaking, causing a red blotch and streak across the film. But I was happy to see that the stars were at least circular, because I was manually guiding the entire length of this 40-minute exposure. And with a little bit of contrast adjustment, I can bring out the Orion Nebula even better. But it's still out of focus, so I decided to try again with a fresh roll of film and a new camera body that was free of light leaks. This roll came out much better. Focusing on a bright star like Sirius yields much better results, but you can't use a Batonov mask, at least not in my experience. Even when pointing at Sirius, it's too dim to see the diffraction spikes through the matte finish of the SLR viewfinder window. Enhancing the contrast of this picture, we can see the Orion Nebula, we can even see a hint of the Running Man Nebula above it, which is a very blue nebula. But the problem is Orion is not supposed to look this blue-purple sheen, it's not showing much of its deep red hydrogen alpha color. Now, of course, by eye, even with a telescope, you won't see the color of the Orion Nebula. The rods of our eyes that provide sensitivity to dim light, like that from a nebula, are not sensitive to color. But the color is there, and you can see it with a camera. But the problem here is the film. I used Kodak Professional Ultra Color Film, and it turns out that it's actually not sensitive to the hydrogen alpha light that dominates the Orion Nebula. 
On the same roll of film, I also tried to take a picture of the Rosette Nebula, which is a dimmer nebula than Orion, and it's also almost entirely hydrogen alpha light. Of course, I didn't yet know that this film emulsion was so insensitive to hydrogen alpha, and if I had, I wouldn't have bothered trying, because as you can see, it just looks like a picture of some stars. You don't even see the nebula. Does that mean the nebula's fake? Doesn't really exist? No, it just means this film emulsion's not sensitive to hydrogen alpha. But the first film emulsion I tried actually was, and that was a different kind of film, called Amber T-800. And you could see the much more red color of Orion in the original blurry picture that I took. Armed with this information, I came back on a later night with a new roll of Amber T-800 and manually guided this one hour long exposure of the Rosette Nebula. And you can clearly see the nebula there. You can also see a streak in the lower right from a plane that flew through the exposure. Of course, this is once again another advantage of shooting digital sub-exposures in stacking. You can simply deselect frames if you want to get rid of plane trails like that. But when you're shooting on film and shooting hour-long exposures like this, what you see is what you get. Still, I'm quite happy with that. I was able to get the Rosette Nebula on film after guiding a one-hour exposure. I also manually guided another one-hour exposure of the Orion Nebula on this new roll of film as well. 25 years ago, I would have killed to be able to get a photo like this through my telescope. You can clearly see the red color of the Orion Nebula, and you can even see a hint of the Running Man above it as well. Here's a one-hour manually guided exposure of the Flame and Horsehead Nebula. The Flame is quite noticeable, but the Horsehead is very faintly there. It would need a much longer exposure under much darker skies to really bring it out. It's a lot easier to get this with a digital CCD camera, but even on film, you can see that it's there. I also did a 10 minute exposure on the galaxies M81 and M82. You can see them clearly in this frame, but with more time on them you would be able to bring out more detail, such as in this digital picture that I took with my SBIG CCD camera previously through the same telescope. As I overlay it on top of the film photo, you can really see those galaxies shine. Both of these pictures were taken with a very simple and cheap Orion achromat riding piggyback on the LX200. So the stars do have chromatic aberration, and this is much more noticeable in the digital version of the picture, because the CCD camera is much more sensitive across a broader portion of the spectrum than film. While most of the shots were on the achromat refractor, I did put the SLR on the main 8-inch LX200 itself for this 5-minute exposure of the Orion Nebula. And because it's a 35mm piece of film, it has a very wide field of view, so it even captures the Running Man, which would normally require a separate shot if I were doing this with a smaller digital sensor. I also put the film SLR camera on my 11-inch Schmidt Cassegrain while it tracked ISS, and I was able to get some exposures of the space station on film. I do plan to try that again in the future with some slower speed film with finer grain for better detail, so stay tuned in the future. But one of the other things I love about film is the fact that you get a physical product at the end of it, the negatives. The light from stars, nebulae, and galaxies chemically altered the film and produced these beautiful negatives that provide a permanent record of what was captured by the telescope. Thanks for watching, and until next time, clear skies.